Welcome everyone to another edition of The Focus TV. This is season five, episode 41. Joined as always by Octavia Wyatt, Raymond Lyons, Cardo Dudley Jr., and Wilson Tarpe Jr. Welcome to this week's edition of The Focus TV. As always, got quite a bit to get through tonight. Talk some NFC East. Uh, Ray's going to wrap up the season for the Washington Mystics. Going to talk about the rest of the WNBA playoffs that's still going. Um, got probably not the greatest update on DC United. I'm going through it quite a bit. Uh, and then we're going to end with some rapid fire. That's it. We'll start with Octavian and NFC East. Uh, you know, week two preseason. Okay, yeah. So we are officially finished with week two. It's kind of breezing by. Um, it's kind of crazy that we really only have one more week of preseason, um, seeing as though that there's no more four games, it's three games. Again, this week there was a lot of starters that played, but there was also a lot of starters that sat. Um, so we didn't get too much information from each game, but these are the things that we did get. Additionally, um, today was a cut down day. All teams needed to have their teams down to an 80 man roster. Um, so usually for most teams, there's about five people that they had to either cut or wave or however they decided to do it. Um, so we'll go over those a little bit. Um, first game, I'll go ahead and start with the Washington Commanders. They played against the Chiefs in preseason. They lost 24 to 14. Um, Sam Howell was 10 to 18, 122 yards, one interception, two carries for 13 yards. Taylor Heine Heineke, nine for 12, 83 yards, one touchdown. Carson Wentz also did play in this game. He was six of nine for 64 yards. Brian Robinson had eight carries for 31 yards. Jared Patterson, two carries, one yard and one touchdown. And Alec Erickson had three receptions for 44 yards. And Cam Sims also had two receptions for 23 yards. Um, it was a solid performance for Wentz. You know, um, that's what most people are looking for when they're looking at the Washington Commanders to see how he's going to perform. He didn't do anything spectacular, but he didn't do what he usually does, which is sometimes get a little overzealous and try a little bit too hard. Um, it just seems like he kept it right in the middle. Wasn't too much. Um, nothing that would like completely stand out. Like I said, he was 6-9, um, 64 yards. Um, he did get sacked early in the uh, midway through the second quarter. It was reported that apparently Rivera was going to have the starters play for pretty much the first half. Um, but with the injury bug, you know, a lot of people get concerns with the injuries, especially in preseason. Carson Woods got sacked pretty heavily in the in the second quarter. Um, it could be, you know, of course, the offensive line, but also, you know, Carson Woods tends to hold the ball a little bit longer than need be. Um, so after that sack, he pulled all the starters, and that was it for them for the rest of the day. Uh, Brian Robinson did start with the starters as a running back, and he looks really good. Um, Antonio Gibson <laughs> is definitely going to have to pay attention to Brian Robinson right behind him um, because if he keeps playing the way he's playing, he can definitely be the starter. Um, if not, when the season starts, possibly somewhere midway through the season. We know Antonio Gibson has a, a case of the fumbles. Um, granted, he didn't have any fumbles in this game. He had a decent shine as well. Um so they had a pretty decent game. One big thing coming out of the, their camp today, uh, Chase Young has officially been ruled out of the first four games of the season. You know, he's recovering from an ACL injury from last year. Um, so he was part of the roster moves that happened today. Uh, the commanders released veteran offensive tackle Rashad Hill and wide receiver Kelvin Harmon. Um, they also placed um, Tyler Lawson, Chase Young on the physically unable to perform list. And then also, like I said, they also placed linebacker Nathan Guerra on the reserve injured list. So that got them down to the minimum 80, um, 80 players on the roster. Um, all teams will have to be down to 53 by next Tuesday. So that's when the real fun of cuts start. Um, so their next game is going to be against the uh, – I didn't even put it down. I'll, I'll get back to you guys on that. I'm sorry I had a brain lapse. But they'll play next week for their final preseason game as well. Um, going on to the next one, New York Giants. Uh, they played against the Bengals this week. They were they beat the Bengals 25-22. Davis Webb was 22-27. 204 yards, two touchdowns, and two carries for one yard. Daniel Jones was 14 of 16, 116 yards. One interception that I'll go ahead and say now that was not his fault. Uh, one carry for five yards. Uh, Tyrod Taylor was 7 of 11, 37 yards, one carry for four yards. Jay Sean Corbin had nine carries for 27 yards and one touchdown. And Alex Bachman, 11 receptions, 122 yards, two touchdowns. And Davis Sills, the fifth, had five receptions for 26 yards. Um, biggest thing coming out of this game that they had a lot of injuries that happened in this game. First round pick, Kayvon Tubido, uh, left the game with the knee injury. He's going to be out three to four weeks with the, MC with the MCL sprain. Um, 
Afterwards, he said he was good, but, you know, adrenaline and players say anything just so nobody worries. Um, but he'll be out three to four weeks. Hopefully, that's all it is because, um, of course, with being the number one, uh, their first-round draft pick for them and, you know, trying to establish himself as a rookie is definitely going to be important. So hopefully he doesn't have too many setbacks, but also rookie linebacker Darren Beavers. He also had a season-ending uh, injury towards ACL in the preseason game. Um, so he will be out as well. Graham Gano had a concussion and wide receiver CJ Board um, had an injury to his ribs. They all left the game. Um, so not a good showing as far as injuries for them. We know how difficult that can be, um, which is probably why Saquon Varpy did not play in this game. Um, I'm pretty sure that they got a lot of work during the joint practices that all the teams had this week. So it was probably a good idea to give him some rest. Um uh, another one, Wendell Robinson, you know, he is supposed to be showing up a little bit more for them. He's not having a great preseason right now, um, especially with David Sills playing the way he's playing and Alex uh, Bachman with the 11 receptions, 122 yards, two touchdowns. He caught the touchdown late in the game from Davis Webb um, to steal the game for them, you know. So any win is a, is a great uh, positive for the New York Giants, so I know that they're riding high with that. Um, for their cuts, they also had um, they moved center Nick Gates and offensive tackle Matt Peart from active pup to reserve pup. Um, so they'll also be required to miss the first four weeks of the season. Um, also, they placed tight end Ricky Seals Jones and Andre Miller on IR. So they just did a little bit of rearranging. They had some injuries, of course, like we just noted. Um, their next game is going to be next week against the Jets. They will have joint practices with the Jets. Dayball has already come out and say he does not want to see a lot of fights. But I digress because there probably will be. Um, next, I'll go to the Philadelphia Eagles. They played against the Browns. They beat the Browns 21 to 20. Gardner Minshew was 14 to 17, 142 yards. Reese Sennett was four of, six, four of nine, excuse me, 69 yards, one touchdown, and three carries for 16 yards. Kenneth Gainwell, 11 carries, 46 yards, and one touchdown. Boston Scott, 10 carries, 33 yards, one touchdown. Jason Huntley had eight carries for 22 yards. Uh, Deion Kane, five receptions for 66 yards. And Devin Island, one reception for 55 yards and one touchdown. Um, it's crazy because the last couple of years, um, we haven't had a lot of good wide receivers. And it's like now out of nowhere, it's just a lot of wide receivers that are playing well and trying to play their way into either maybe a fifth or sixth uh, wide receiver spot. We know who the top four are. But as of late, Deion Kane had a really good showing in this past game. Um, Devon Allen, um, granted, he hasn't had a lot of exposure during this training camp. Um, of course, the big note on him is that he's an Olympian hurdler and he has jets. Um, the 55 yard touchdown that he caught from recent, it was, I, I, I didn't even know what was going to happen. I was like, what is happening right now? Um, so you can see that he has a lot of speed and, and honestly, that's for whatever reason, something that the Philadelphia Eagles love. Um, I either reason that they decided to pick Jalen Rager over Justin Jefferson and DK Metcalf, but I digress. Um, so it, it's going to be interesting to see what the wide receivers do. Um, granted, no starters really played in this game, and it showed on defense. The defensive <laughs> unit was getting thrashed. Um, granted, I will say it was both. It was the same for both sides. Offensively, for each team, they had a really strong showing. Um, even with um, backup running backs playing, if you want to consider Boston Scott a backup, um, and Kenneth Gainwell because they both got plenty of snaps last year. Um, Miles Sanders being injured again um, definitely shows a lot that they have to be considerate of um, as far as the rushing game. But they looked good in the rushing game. Um, but, again, we won't really know much until we really get the starters in. Um, Cam Jurgens, uh, uh, the center that's going to be the heir apparent to just Jason Kelsey, looks really, really good. I know a lot of people were, you know, sprung off of the – the viral video from Jordan Davis and him a couple weeks ago, but he looks really, really good. He literally looks like Jason Kelsey, and it's crazy because apparently that was the reason why he was drafted because Jason Kelsey felt as though that he was the most like him, um, and it definitely shows. Um, so um, right now, for cuts, Philadelphia waved Josh Blackwell, uh, DeAndre Torrey was a running back, Blackwell's a cornerback, and Jared Williams was offensive line, um, while also placing Brett Toth and Tyree Jackson in reserve, physically unable to perform list. Um, again, like I said, they're going to have to do this again next week to get down to 80, um, excuse me, to 53 from 80. 
Um, their next game is going to be next week um, against the Dolphins. So I'll be very interested to see who plays for both sides of that, just because there's been a lot of talk about both of these teams in this offseason. Last but not least, Dallas Cowboys played against the Chargers. They defeated the Chargers 32-18. to Will Greer was 6-10, 98 yards, one carry for nine yards. Uh, Cooper Rush, 3 of 6, 32 yards. Ben DiNucci had, was 2 for 2 for 2 yards. 2 carries for a negative 2 yards. Rico Dowdle, Dowdle, excuse me, 13 carries for 44 yards and 1 touchdown. Malik Davis, 8 carries, 37 yards, 1 touchdown. Brandon Smith had 2 receptions for 51 yards. And Jake Ferguson had 2 receptions for 29 yards. Biggest story, Kayvon Turnup, who was an MVP for the United States Football League this past season. Huh, I mean, he had a kickoff for 98 yards for a touchdown in the first quarter and then a punt for an 86-yard ret- uh, return in the second quarter. Um, apparently, he's the first player in nine seasons to have a kickoff and punt return touchdown in the same game, granted it's preseason. But, hey, with somebody who is fighting for a roster spot coming from the USL, uh, coming out of TCU and the, the trajectory and the things that he's gone through as a player to be where he is, you definitely have to give him the credit for stepping up as it is. Um, there's still a lot of uh, shuffling with the offensive line, trying to find a good fit because um, it's definitely going to be a little bit difficult coming up. Tyler Smith had a better game. Um, definitely, I know the big thing that a lot of people were talking about last week were the penalties. Penalties were not a big as, a, as big as an issue as last week. So it's progression. You know, that's what you expect in preseason. Maybe that's what Mike McCarthy was talking about, but a lot of people just don't like to listen to him talk anymore, and I don't blame them. Um, so again, they will be playing next week against the Seahawks. So again, final preseason game. Um, it'll be interesting to see who plays. We know Dak didn't play, CD didn't play, none of the big names played. A lot of people with the joint practices, a lot of the ones get a lot of work in those, so they tend to not really need the actual live practices during the preseason. Uh cuts for the for the Cowboys, linebacker Christian Sam, wide receiver Jaquiro Roberson, and cornerback Quandre Mosley have all been waived. A uh, quicker uh, kicker, Liam, I'm not going to say his last name because I will butcher it, had already been cut early on in today. And veteran tight end Jeremy Sprinkle was placed on injury reserve with an Achilles issue uh, ending his 2022 season. Um, so it's going to be tough again with the injuries. Um, I'm honestly, I'm already tired of preseason. I just really wish the season would start at this point. Because I, as much as I love for the backups to get their chance to shine, I'm ready to see the ones <laughs> And ready to see who's doing what. Um, the first week of games are going to be bananas, so I'm just ready for the season to start. Yeah, I think most people are. So final week of preseason uh, this week. Then obviously no fourth preseason game. And what's new is because there's no fourth preseason game, it's like I think 15 to 17 days before week one. So you got some teams that have folks that are starting or folks that are coming back from injury. You know, that injury report might look different, you know, in a 17-day span. Uh, Ray. The Mystics. Oh, man. Uh, so, um, Mystics season is officially over. Uh, they were swept out the first round of the playoffs by Seattle Storm. Um, you know, they they went to Seattle and dropped two. Uh, game one, it was right there for them. But, um, you know, some uh, some missteps down the stretch, you know, they, they blew a golden opportunity. Then um, Seattle came back in game two. They smelled blood and handled business. Um, you know, the things that we've been talking about the entire regular season were were the Achilles heel in their, in their first round playoff series. Um, you know their effectiveness outside of Elena. You know it, it's been inconsistent the entire year, and um, and it showed up at the worst possible time. Uh, game two, uh, Seattle just made it clear that you know we're not taking any chances. We're going to swarm Elena with that with everything we have, and there's somebody else to beat us. And, um, you know, we, we saw how that ended, you know, um, game one, she, she wrecked them, man. She went toe to toe with Stooley, um, you know, and it was a, it was a close game and the Mystics should have won, but, um, you know, Drew Lloyd got hot in the fourth quarter of, of that game and, uh, you know, put him away, uh, game two, uh, Miss was just playing catch up from, from jump, uh, Seattle had a strong start. They led 27, 17 at the end of the first quarter and, uh, you know, the Mystics, they fought and clawed, but you know, they, they just could never get over the hump. Uh, Seattle was too efficient on both sides of the ball. And um, the, the Mystics were just missing a second punch, man. Um, you know, they that that's something they definitely got to figure out. Um, 
you know, me and Wilson and Cardell have talked about, you know, the, the continuity issue for the entire season. But, you know, that's something they knew going in and should have been um, better prepared for. Uh, you know, I know it's tough when you actually get out there, but they're professionals for a reason, man. And um, and it's not like they're <laughs> they're not very talented outside of Elena. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm sure uh, Coach T is going to look at some things in the offseason season. Um, you know, they, they have another lottery pick this year via the uh, Los Angeles Sparks. So they're going to be able to add another <laughs> extremely talented young player. Or um, who knows, they may package that pick and try to, uh, you know, get a vet. But, um, yeah, man, it's it, – it's, I, I think they, they expected more of themselves this season. Um, you know, this was really the first time in a couple years that they – has anything that resembled a normal season for them. You know, like we all know what happened in 2020, um, you know, with the pandemic and everything. And then 2021, they were riddled with injuries the entire year. Uh, this year, really the only thing they mainly had to deal with was uh, Elena's um, load management process. Um, and Alicia Clark, she she was coming back off injury as well. So she wasn't fully herself. Um, she's just trying to, you know, work back into things. But, you know, with – um with the evolution of um, Ariel and, and Tasha kind of coming to their own, you know, things should have been a lot smoother. You know, at times they look lost without, without Elena being there, um, you know, and then times they, they play well, but you know, they, they're, they're, they're a veteran group at this point for the most part, you know, with a couple of youngsters sprinkled in there, but um, the youngsters are kind of ahead of schedule, so to speak, you know, Ariel acting, she's grown up. <laughs> really quickly um you know she she's an olympian at this point um you know she's been on a all defensive team every year of her career uh then our offensive game is starting to catch up so uh so yeah man it's um of course nothing you can do about it now but you know things should have ended better for them you know at, at the very least we should have been uh we should be preparing for a game three tomorrow but um you know they Things happen in Seattle, got it done. Um, you know, I'm just excited to see what the rest of the WNBA playoffs have to offer. But, um, but yeah, man, the Mystics, they'll, they'll still be in the mix. It's just a matter of if they were to maximize their potential because this year was, um, you know, it was supposed to be a year they returned to that championship conversation. And on paper, they were there. Uh, Shakira Austin, man, she had a great rookie season. Uh, but they um, they they kind of exposed her as a rookie in the Seattle series, and that's no – um. You know, no discredit to her. She fought. She did what she could. But you you go through these lumps as a player, man. And uh, you know, hopefully she'll learn from that and just come back next season better. And uh, yeah, just just looking forward to what they do in the off season and uh and what kind of season they'll have next year. Yeah, um, that's pretty much it. Uh, listening in on a bunch of the exit interviews today, and that's kind of sentiment. A lot of players are saying that that uh the loss hasn't kicked all the way in, and you know all that. But uh, most of all, is uh the roster might look different. What that entails, we shall see. We know uh, Coach T doesn't really just sit on his laurels too often. Um, got some decisions as far as free agency goes. Um, never can rule out trades. You brought up the lottery pick. We have no idea what's in store. Um, I think the biggest thing, like, I think one of the biggest things I heard today was, uh, you know, Ariel Atkins is always just a straight shooter. It's kind of like, um, you know, she talked about herself getting better every year. And something essentially to the fact, like, as long as I keep getting better, you know, we'll have a chance, we'll have a better chance to win the championship as she continues to get better. And that's cool. That, that is very true. That said, I'm interested in seeing what happens this offseason, but they had an opportunity, and it was lost. And you, for those of you that tune in to Mystics Outlook for most of the year, um, I think we were pretty upfront with some, we kind of identified those issues all through the year. And, you know, after game one, we identified those issues again, where it snuck up, uh, not snuck up, but where it popped up at. And, uh, you know, we're here now. Uh, you can catch the last episode of Mystics Outlook for this season. Uh, Ray and I discussed uh, discussed uh, the entire season outlook, looked a little bit ahead and what have you. Um, get over to our, our Roku channel um, and check that out. It's up. And we're going to take our first break. When we get back, we'll talk about the rest of the WNBA playoffs because there's a lot more going on. Um, we are still not out of the uh, first round, which feels weird saying that. Uh, got some interesting, you know, some pivotal games coming up in the next 48 hours. But you're watching the Focus TV. We will return shortly. Welcome back to the Focus TV. 
I'm gonna put this up on the screen for you guys as well. Uh, so Ray talked about the Mystics just a short while ago. Uh, just to update you guys on what's happened since the last time we talked to you guys about the playoffs, the Aces, like the Storm, they swept their first round opponents, uh, beating the shorthanded Mercury in two games. Uh, the Aces will face the Storm in game one of the semifinals, semifinals beginning Sunday at 4 p.m. Um, Tuesday night, tonight as we're taping this, uh, we have the Liberty hosting the Sky in the pivotal game three. And then we have Dallas hosting Connecticut Wednesday night in a pivotal game three. And reports came out today that Dallas pop may possibly have the surfaces of Juan Enrique Agumbawale, which makes it all, you know, that much more interesting. That said, um, just want to get, you know, you guys' thoughts as to where we are right now. Um, heading into, obviously, these two game threes. Um, Cardell, we'll start with you. All right. Um, as for the game tonight, Chicago and the Liberty, I just think the Chicago didn't take them seriously at first in the first game. Uh, and they gave him a wake-up call, you know, let them know it's the playoffs that they got to come to play. And then, uh, you know, in the second game, they got to basically show that they were fully awake and they beat the hell out of the level. Uh, the margin was 40, 57, 57, something like that. It was, it was ugly. So I expect them to go up to New York tonight and uh, handle business, you know, defend the champs, you know what they got to do. Uh, I know Candace Parker don't want to go out like this. This is the first round, bro. That'll be her last game, a L. So I, I expect them to be locked in and, and not play any games and do their handle business. Connecticut and Dallas worries me because I didn't like what I saw with Connecticut at all. Um, they have kind of the same type of issues that the, the Mystics have where they don't always pay attention to the details and always come to play. But they don't have the championship experience where they can kind of figure it out, pull themselves out of it at times. And you see, you saw Rare's ugly head. No way they they – they, they they should be over too. Their series should be over if they all came to play. I know, look, Jasmine's been out. That's the starter point guard. They miss her dearly. Uh, but you still got John Quill and Alyssa Bonner. They should be dominating. And this is without uh, Ogun Bawala. So uh, anything goes now because uh, now the series is in Dallas. If you say Enrique plays, we all know what she can bring, man. Like she she. <laughs> She could put 30 on your head quick, you know what I mean? And, and that would be tough coming off an injury, but if anyone can do it, it's her. Uh, she, she's a tough scorer, man, and this is why you don't play these type of games uh, with, with opponents. You get them up out of there because when you get them life, it becomes a dog fight. And then at that point, anything can go, man. And then um, this will be a big upset if they pull this off, man. So I'm, I'm definitely worried about that because I, I didn't like what I saw in the last game at all, man. It, it was just uh, – it was so uncharacteristic of them, man. It, it was it was a weird game, but they they, they got to figure out something, man. Um, and it can't just be all on John Quill to put on a cape to win, because she got she got to deal with those monsters that the Wings have all, as well. You know, they're inexperienced. They 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 come in waves. <laughs> they got a lot of them. And then you know you know with Alyssa too. You know what I mean? Brianna Jones, she was stepping up. It's really their perimeter, their guard play, the Suns guard play that hasn't been up to par. They got to step up big time. Because Mabry and Gray, they tore them up. Uh, they, they, oof. And now Enrique is coming back. Yeah, it, it, it can be tough, man. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with that, man. Uh, obviously, uh, the Aces in Seattle, ooh, that's tough. <laughs> that, that's real tough. Ooh. And I think those was uh, MVP front runners, too, with uh, Asia and, you know, Stewie. So, man, that's tough. That's the five, though. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't call that one. I gotta look at it more. I can't go there. Yeah. <laughs> That's a tough series, man. <laughs> That's a tough one, man. Because like the Aces on the perimeter with Jackie and Plum and, and Chelsea, whew, they like. But the Seattle can match up with that. That's what I'm saying. It's just, but the, the Aces, they're the best three-point shooting team in the league. That, that's what gives them. The, at the edge over most teams, you know what I mean? And then, um, obviously, you got Asia in the middle or not, and Hamby. That's tough, man. I got to look at that more, man. It might come down to the reserve, man. And But Seattle's so well coached. It, it, it's tough. I got. I need more time. I got I to really look at that one. But, yeah, yeah I think I'm going to handle business, and I, I'm going to get an edge to John Quill. That I, I got I to, gotta, you know, GW, man. I got to get an edge to her. You know, they got the experience, man, but – 
they better come ready to play. That's all I'm gonna say. Yeah, um Yeah, that semifinals is crazy. That feels like, you know, sometimes sports we have those games before the championship games, it feel like whoever come out of that is kinda like let you know what it is. It's that's a heavyweight fight. It's one of those championship between for the championship type matchups. That's what that feels like. Like you said, two MVP, you got the the two folks competing for the MVP at it. Um yeah, that's gonna be nuts. That said, I tell you, what do you think about the playoffs this far? We talked about where we're at, and then then once she's done, Ray, want to hear what you have to say about the rest of the playoffs. Now that you know, we, you talked about the Mystics already. Yeah, I mean, to start off where Cardell ended, like I'm so excited for this series, like to see the Aces and the Storm go at it. Like you said, they're so well matched up, but you know, the starters, and I definitely do believe that it will come down to the bench because you know Seattle's bench has been kind of on and off throughout the season. Um, so just to see how they're going to be able to do it. And, you know, granted with it being, you know, Super Bowl's last hurrah, I just, just wanting to really see how hard they go at it. Um, but man, even just to talk about, you know, the aces in the last series, I mean, Chelsea Gray is just, she's a dog. Yeah, like, and I love, I just love how hard she goes and I love how she like feeds into the energy of it, you know, the whole situation where she got like turned up because it looked like they was getting a little bit, a little chippy out there. And she just played it. She just, she just showed them really who was better just playing in the game. And, and it was just like, it was just like a light switch. It was like, Oh, okay. I can do this anytime I want to. Okay. This is what y'all really thought it was. All right, cool. And just to know that you got a dog like that in your team, like you can never count them out of anything. I mean, and just to see Becky Hammond, you know, coach the way that she coaches and getting them all to buy in, um, cause you know, they've been on the cusp of winning a, uh, winning a championship the last couple of years. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if they can really, you know, get it done. Um, but that series is just going to be like you said, nuts. It's just, I can't pick one either. I just really just want to watch it. Um, on the other side, the Chicago and uh, Liberty series. I mean, I was definitely taken aback. Um, crazy thing is I was at work and I was like, dang, I'm gonna miss the beginning of the game. And I was like, all right, I mean, but by the time I watched it, like, Chicago probably would have already, like, pulled away. And then, like, by the time I left, I was like, wow, like, Sabrina Escu, I mean, we know who she is. And she's just consistently getting better every year. Um, and, I, and I definitely believe it. it's, it's kind of like what Cardell said. It's just Chicago just took them real lightly. And the second game, it was just like, all right, so we played with y'all in the first game, but we, we can't play no more. Um, especially because, you know, their coach came out and already didn't like how the format was. And now here you are on the opposite end of said format. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see them go into Brooklyn tonight. And uh, I believe walk away with the W as well. Um, and then the Connecticut and Dallas series. Yeah, I mean, Connecticut looked real um, comfortable in the first game. But it was, you know, Dallas was able to bounce back and get a roll win um, and play really, really hard. Um Kayla Thorne, you know, leading with the 20 points. She had a really, really good game. And if they get a recap back, it, it, it can go any way. But like you said, I definitely do have faith in John Quell, although it can't all be on John Quell. Um, but, you know, reigning MVP as of now, John Quell Jones, she should be able to step up. And I think that they'll come out, you know, really, really hard as well. Um, and I think that they should be able to wrap up the series tonight as well. So to see then Chicago, possibly, this is me just looking into the future, Chicago, um, in Connecticut, that's gonna be another Diamond White series. So I'm just, I'm just ready for it to keep going. Right. Yeah, man. These uh, these game threes giving um, totally different vibes. You know, I, I think, I definitely think Chicago gonna go ahead and um, you know, get them up out of here. Uh, you know, uh, Cardell and I'll tell you touched on it. You know, game one, they just <laughs> was kind of out there. That was a very uncharacteristic game for them. A lot of turnovers, a lot of mistakes. Uh, Chicago is known for executing extremely well offensively. Um, and then, yeah, game two, they they just had to remind them that this is a two seven series. And um, yeah, they they just curb stomp. Man, that was that was bad. I think they said that was the uh, the largest margin of victory in WNBA playoff history. So man, they yeah they they turned them into a a Jeopardy answer, <laughs> but um yeah Connecticut and Dallas man that Connecticut should win, but um like Cardell pointed out man the way they came out in Game Two that that that's just concerning and it's not like um 
they haven't displayed that before. And now you get a young Dallas team at home. You know, that was the first win in uh in Dallas Wings history in the playoffs. And now they get a chance to close out a series on their home floor. You know, the, the thing about young teams, we talk about all the time, they too young to know better. <laughs> like so uh they could they just come come out guns blazing, man, and and Connecticut can find themselves on the on the wrong end of a of a surge. So um they gonna have to come out early and, and establish dom- dominance. Like you you're already in the do or die game. You don't want to leave it up to chance. You don't want these people to come out with confidence and get rolling because it's gonna be hard to shut that water off, especially if they get a reggae back. Because we all know what she does in these type of situations. Um and uh the aces in Seattle, that's that's probably gonna be the best series in this playoffs. You know, just um two two of the best teams in the league, you know, two superstars going head to head. Um, Vegas, man, they've been right on the cusp before. Um, I think they just tired of being a bridesmaid, man. I think they feel like this is, this is their year. And, you know, the way they've been playing the entire season, man, they, they, they just look like they on a mission. Um, You know, one thing that Seattle is not going to have the luxury of that they had last season, those, uh, those aces guards, they gonna go at Sue Bird relentlessly. You know, they they gonna put them the forty one year old legs to the test, man. And um and and it's gonna be no relief for her to be perfectly honest, because you are gonna have to go from Chelsea to Jackie Young to Kelsey, and like I don't, I don't care who you are, I don't care if you're the best defensive point guard in the league. That's that's a rough life right there, man. So um and then of course with Asia. You know that's that's a beast in itself. Um, but you know Seattle, they they got firepower to go right back at them. So um, both teams are extremely well coached. You know, extremely disciplined. You know, they got experience. Um, yeah, man, I I'm definitely not missing a second of that series. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you, Wilson. Man, this is one of those whoever wins this is going to win it all type deals. I mean, of course you can't you can't count out. Uh, Chicago, who I think is going to come out the, the other side of the bracket, but um, but yeah, man, this this series is <laughs> this is going to be that series for this playoffs. That 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 that, uh, that matchup has it just it just screams heavy, heavyweight. Go ahead, Cardo. You know, this is why it's funny about matchups because the Mystics bust the Aces ass all season. This, this is what, this is what this is what I'm saying. Like they destroyed them, man. Like. It was bad, like yo, y'all the number one. It's dog, like that's what I'm saying. It just comes back. That's why it's hard to say that because it's like the team they just swept, the, the Seattle Storm just swept. The Mystics handled with ease, but I don't see Seattle doing that to the Aces. You know what I'm saying? Because it, it, it's just the matchups, and, and it, it, it's just it's just wild how that just comes into play in the playoffs. Like you get the wrong matchup, it's, a, it's hell, and you can be up out of there. But you could be a championship team if you avoid it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, all right, remember the NBA playoffs? Everybody in their mother was scared of the Nets. They're like, oh, man, we do not want to play the Nets. It's a tanky game. Boston, like, it don't even matter. We're going to play who else. So Boston ended up with them, sweeping them boys. And then they end up in the finals. <laughs> it, it's just wild how that how that plays out, man. And that's why it's just it's this series just – it may just come down to coaching. You know what I'm saying? Who who, who – Get their team to uh, uh, execute the best, and uh, if that's got to get Seattle, man, because in one time they get it done. Yeah, that, that's and that and again that goes back to the most frustrating part about the Mystic season, because <laughs> there was a stretch if you took care of business when the first two games would have been played at the ESA, and Seattle's not Seattle on the road. They, they, those are two those are totally different teams. However, what was done is what was done. You reap what you sow. <laughs> you know? Hey, hey, look. Exception to Drew Lloyd. She is Drew Lloyd no matter where. You're right. Wherever you go in the world. <laughs> Drew Lloyd is Drew Lloyd. You ain't never lie. <laughs> you were so right. No matter what planet you on, Drew Lloyd is Drew Lloyd. The later it goes in the game, she's always on time. <laughs> All right? Um... But yeah, like you said, that's what's the crazy part of matchups for. The Mystics have a perimeter trio 
that had fun against the Aces. The Aces guards had nowhere to go. Just, oh, we got one for you. We'll just switch them all. Meanwhile, here comes Seattle. Jules like bucket, bucket, bucket. <laughs> like, it, it, it's, again, like you said, matchups are crazy. And that's the part of luck in sports some people talk about. Not always the injuries, but the matchups. Sometimes it's literally just the matchups. Like it's it 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 starts it stops right there. That's what, and last thing. That's probably what they saying. Because if I'm Sue, I know what you saying, Ray. But if I'm Sue and all that, I'm like I'm watching film on them. I'm like, well, they probably mess with Tosh and all that. I'm good. Let's get this stuff. That's what I'm saying. I'm like I'm good. Oh, I ain't worried about that. If they can't deal with them, I'm good. So it ain't nothing I ain't seen. Let's do this. When is it Sunday? All right, I'll be be ready. Like Sunday so. at four, um, yeah, Sunday at four, mm -hmm. and one of the biggest things for Seattle is the health of Gabby Williams. Hopefully, she recovers and is ready to and be involved in the series. Because uh, I know a lot of y'all don't care about glue players or whatever. She is stupid important mm -hmm. to that team. Just gonna throw that out there. I know it's not it's not fun or it's not a it's super exciting or flashy thing to say. You want to talk about glue players? She's a star in her role, especially for Seattle. Um, so, again, we look forward to the series. Can't wait to watch it and talk with you guys next week about it. We're going to take a second break. When we get back, uh, provide you guys an update on DC United and what wasn't a very good week. You're watching the Focus TV. Welcome back to the Focus TV. As promised, uh, some DC United before we uh, end things with rapid fire. Uh, Black and Red, they had two games last week. Um, they fell to LAFC last Tuesday night on the road. Um, despite the result, they were they were they were solid in that match. There were some encouraging things to take away from it. Um, LAFC on paper and in actual real life as well. Like from an attacking standpoint, they do not have an issue. Um, surrendering one goal was big. Um, the other thing is it's one of those things where if you watch the game, like these United had chances, but y'all heard me all season failing to capitalize on set chances. Got to put you in a place where you are, where you've been this year. Um, however, whatever positive vibes or feelings you had coming from last Tuesday night's game, all of that went out the window rather quickly um, by their effort or their not their effort, but their performance or lack thereof on Saturday night at Audi. Uh, Philadelphia came to town. Um, Philadelphia beat D.C. United 6-0. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of the, the score. The score speaks rather loudly. Um, I don't think there's there's any need to really uh, you know pull up the pull up the hood on this and check underneath. Uh, Wayne Rooney straightforward in his team's performance following the match. Uh, quote disappointed, frustrated, and embarrassed by the second half performance. It hurts. I don't want to see that again. Every player in that second half was a complete stranger to what I've seen in training, what I've seen in previous games. You can lose games, but there's a manner in how that happens. Midfielder Victor Paulson, one of the you know the the many new additions they've made, um, he addressed the match as well. Every single one of us needs to take effing responsibility. That's just how it is. It's not acceptable. I'm ashamed to be captain today. Losing 6-0, probably one of the worst days of my career. End quote. Like, I feel like what they had to say is more than enough. I don't need to put any tape on for y'all to watch. Um, there's there's nothing left to talk about as far as the the the, the year and what can come out of it. Like literally right now is laying the foundation for whatever 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 Rooney plans to to go into the future with, right? Um, obviously, I think they get I don't uh, I think they might get Christian Benteke uh, back soon. Well, he'll make his debut soon. Um, that said, uh, look man, there's a lot of things that have to happen here for them to head back in the right direction. Um, this was one. At one time, you know, we go back in history. It was one of those staples of this league. Like you mentioned MLS, you couldn't leave out DC United. Um, and that was this, I think that was the second time this year they've got blanked by Philly. And the first time it was add one more goal onto it underneath a different coach. Um, and Philly, you know, <laughs> you got to love teams and their social media, uh, teams and their social media departments. Horrible. Horrible on social media. And no one can say anything back to Philly because the score was the score. They were clowning from midway through the match all the way through. They're still clowning. Um, but, yeah, man, uh, we're going to see how the rest of the year goes. But 
whatever whatever you know those those feelings were you know a couple weeks ago about trying to get things going in the right direction and maybe finishing the season strong what have you right, look man we're gonna see where this goes but uh baby steps one and then two um personnel wise you know we were talking about the mystics what the roster might look like um you know it is professional sports um i don't think it's it's wrong of me to say you know that evaluating process is real and it might be heating up um Obviously, the guys that just got brought in wouldn't be worried about them. Everybody else, look, man, it, it, it's going to be interesting. Uh, but these aren't the type of performances you want to have while you're clearly being evaluated. Um, but we'll see, man. Uh, we'll see how they bounce back. They got another game this week. Uh, but uh, last week was not a good week. Um, you know, you had... And you know how sometimes, you know, you know you're going through it or, you know, things make waves in news. You know, we work in it. We see it. Where sometimes a team does good, it doesn't make national headlines. When you know when things go to the wayside, it's being talked by national folks that weren't paying any attention to the team to begin with. It was it was that type of loss. Um, you know how far have they fallen from what they used? Like all those conversations were happening um, by national folks this week. It was it's a tough week. We're gonna see how they respond, man. But um, it is a tough week as a whole. Cardell, what you got for us in rapid fire? You know we got some time left. We're going to start in Brooklyn. Uh, I'll be KD. Uh, staying in Brooklyn. According to a statement from GM Sean Marks, uh, he said Coach Steve Nash and I, together with Bill Sai and uh, Claire Wuzai, met with Kevin Durant with Prime in Los Angeles uh, yesterday. Uh, we have agreed to move forward with our partnership. We are focusing on basketball. We have to let the go around, building a lasting franchise, and bringing championship to Brooklyn. Uh, the result, them resolving the situation brought a lot of drama from a couple of NBA players. Uh, Patrick Beverly chimed in. He said, y'all can sit and don't say nothing, but that ain't cool. It's dudes with families out here who haven't got a job because of this baby ish. And to be on and off ain't cool. Bless him, man. KD responded to Pat Bear's tweet with a blame KD hashtag. Pat Bear responded, damn gang, who said I was talking about you? I'm speaking of how it was down both sides. We keep that private, but noted. And then Isaiah Thomas added, can we sign now? Uh, just what are your thoughts on, I'm going to start with you, I'll say, just what are your thoughts on this whole situation finally being resolved? Uh, just ended up being a bunch of nothing, but a bunch of crime. And then, you know. Basically, uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. It ended up being a bunch of nothing, a bunch of crime, a bunch of doing all of these fake, well, Oh, the Boston is interested. Uh, I think even before the news broke today, they were talking about Memphis was interested. Like, I'm just, I was literally just sitting here like, I, I would, I would tell Katie like, right now, like, like I don't understand. And it seemed like they had already told him no. <laughs> so that's why I was like, I don't know why this is still a story. Um, I don't know why we're still talking about this. You signed a four year contract. <laughs> like you signed a whole four year contract, you have no leverage here. Um, so honestly, I'm glad it's over. I hope it's over. I hope they don't talk about it anymore. But now, all they're going to be talking about is you know, now Katie and Kyrie's still going to be there, or maybe they'll still talk about Kyrie possibly going to LA. Who knows? Um, but I'm just glad that this saga with the whole ultimatum thing is over. Um, I like the fact that they made a point to say, you know, me, Sean Marks, and Steve Nash all talked to uh, to KD. Like, hey, we all told him. And I feel like in this conversation, they're probably like, it ain't going to happen, bro. <laughs> like, I just feel like that's probably what they said. Like, it's not going to happen. So let's just figure out what we can do and move on. And I think maybe finally KD saw the error of his ways. Maybe he realized that, you know, I can't get out of this. And we all know. He wasn't going to miss a whole year of basketball or however long, because like I said, who knows the four year contract. So all in all, a bunch of nothing. And I'm, I'm just glad it's over. <laughs> all right, Ray. Yeah. I mean, they, they just wasted everybody's time. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's people's fault for being stupid and feeding into it to begin with like that. It's, there was never a scenario where he was going to get traded. Like, because, and rightfully so, the Nets were like, you got to give me your firstborn, <laughs> your wife, your kids, your house, your car, everything, and 
teams just wasn't willing to do that. Um, so, and he was under contract. Like all the power was in was with the franchise. So I don't I don't understand why people even fed into it. But these are the times we live in. Um, people have knee jerk reactions to everything. So, um, so yeah. Now it's officially done. Um, it was done for me once KD signed his extension. So, you know what have you. But um, yeah, man. And <laughs> of course, Pat Bev always has something to say. God bless him. <laughs> um, I mean, he he wasn't wrong, but such is life, man. <laughs> like, and it, well, hold on, is is he one of the people that's in limbo because of this? Did he get traded? Possibly. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I don't mean he won't get shipped again, possibly. And then, um, but like, dog, don't don't throw stones and hide your hands. Like, I wasn't talking about you. Yeah, you were. <laughs> <laughs> it did. Uh, Isaiah Thomas. I I love it to death, but bro, I I don't think you're on anybody's radar. To be perfectly honest, man, like. You know, and and that's that's no disrespect to him, but I mean he's still trying to get back to a space where, you know, he can prove he can be consistently effective again. You know, after his his constant battles with injuries, um, but I, I really just think he was he was being funny and um and just kind of uh <laughs> making light of the situation. But yeah, um, I mean it it happens every year, man. Like, well not every year, but whenever there's a one of those names we talk about that affect the league, things are on hold until that pizza moves or doesn't move. So, um, so yeah, if you don't like it, then either try to become one of those names or just shut up and deal with it. It, it is what it is. But, um, yeah, moving forward, you know, Cardell talks all the time about how quiet the owner's been. It, it's going to get nasty out here. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> You know, uh, if if man, if Pat Bev ain't like this, hold up, then, <laughs> boy, that lockout gonna be something. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I'm just glad it's officially done, so they can people can move on to something else. I think a couple of weeks ago I said it just reminded me of the Debo Samuel thing, which is a whole bunch of noise about a whole bunch of nothing for two people who weren't going anywhere. Um, hey. Debo's a niner. He was just on social media yesterday celebrating the new purchase of a new house on the West Coast, which during all the, you know, the back and forth, he despised the West Coast and what wasn't going to play for the Niners because he had to be on the East Coast. Blah, 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 blah. He looked very happy in his new spacious house with the new contract he just received for the team he was drafted by. Uh, Kevin Durant, again, going back to the, I think most of us had this sentiment at the beginning. You sign like you, unlike you, your peers, the other two dudes are there with you. You were you were the first to sign a four-year deal. Once you locked it for four years, I mean, you know, it is what it is. Um, with the Nets, like, cool, you held your line. I'm interested to see if anything comes out to see if any concessions were made, because you know I, I see a lot of people going crazy about everything that's happened, and we don't know everything. But how, however, what we do know is it made no sense on any level for the Nets. To let that man leave that building no matter what was wrong with him. It just He's contractually obligated to play for four years. Um, if Rudy Gobert is going for whatever that price was, Lord, that price went to no. Like, yes, the, you had the same price the Niners had for Debo. Yeah, I move him. This is the price. Nah, I'm not trying to pay that. The price is the price. Like, am I going to get mad at either organization for not moving off the price? Yeah, I'm going to list some... I'm going to list the most outrageous asking price in the world and sit there with a straight face and go, you will not match it. Like, we're here. It is what it is. Like Ray said, hope it just goes away, man. But, um, again, like, sometimes I know everyone always jumps to the social media part about everything. Sometimes just take a second, chill, and think before jumping down these wild tangents and rabbit holes about everything. Um, sometimes things just aren't possible to happen. Like, you know. For like I don't know, like real life reasons and stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna be quick. I just think these dudes are just too emotional. Um, also, I don't think that the Nets asked for anything. I think 
there's something deeper going on around the league where the owners were in conjunction where you don't touch that dude because of their piss. Like, we're not trading for them. This is the last straw. They're being quiet. So I think it's going to get real serious when that CBA gets to, get to, get to come in. And the players want to lose one way or another. Either they're going to lose that percentage or we're going to be in a lockdown. Y'all going to lose y'all money one way or another because I think they're not crossing the line. It ain't just KD. Uh, you can put the Ben Simmons situation, even though I understood Ben's situation more because they threw his ass under the bus. Uh, but really, James Harden, Nick, he done quit on like two teams. Like people forgetting about that to get his way. Owners are, owners are fed up. It's like, yo, y'all not even – and this is what I do agree with Pat Bev. He said another tweet I didn't um, put up there and read, but he was talking about how this is just not good business. Like you sign a contract – we always on the owners like, man, they don't care about the players, but we got to do our part and honor what we signed for. And it's like a lot of players feel like, man, and I don't know what they gassed up off of, they, the yes men in their circle, social media, kissing their ass or whatever. It's like that's not how the real world works. Now, you sign a contract legally, you have to honor this, or there will be consequences. And I'm going to get more out of this situation than what you were obligated to give me in the first place. So why not just give it to me? So it's, it's setting a bad precedent. And, and 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 it's only setting a bad precedent because the the top, whatever five percent of the league, mm-hmm. are the ones benefiting from doing this crap. Where the rest of the league gonna take the L, because now if the lockout happens, yo, the ninth, tenth man, the guy that might be just became a starter, but he's he's on his rookie deal, he's not on the second contract yet. I hope they save him, because where you gonna get that money back from? And they gonna be hurting. KD and them like man, whatever, and all that talk, all that noise, because they they got. Um, generational money. They can sit back and chill. And them little LeBrons, K, uh, Kyrie's, and all that, that. That's fine for them. But what about the rest of the NBA? And this is the problem with having superstars run everything because they don't have everybody's best interests at heart. Even though know, they may act like they do and try to hide behind with all the owners and the teams doing it. Hell, you fucking me too. So, I mean, damn. You know what I'm saying? So, it, it, it's just... That's what I'm more so looking at, man, because it's just like I don't think they really understand <laughs> what's about to come, man, because they not – like the owners that normally talk me quiet, like I'm looking at Mark Cuban, he's been real quiet. <laughs> All he's going to talk about war stories from the past. He ain't said nothing. Uh, Ted ain't said nothing. Normally Ted to throw something out there. Ted, no, Ted ain't said nothing. Bomber ain't said nothing, dog. Like they quiet, quiet. Only, only you've heard his side when he came out like, yeah – I stand behind the gym and the coach. Now, let me get back to golfing. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. Rebecca Lobo, so, so happy to be with you. You know, look, we're going to see, but I, I, I think it's going to get ugly, man. But moving, moving on. Uh, Dennis Rodman, Will Chamberlain, Bill Russell. Andre Drummond uh, believes he is as good or better than any of them on the glass. Uh, the NBA veteran entering his 11th season. This for the Bulls is arguably the best man. The best we've done the league the past decade, and then on trips where he grew up to Connecticut to help out the YMCA where he learned to play. Uh, Drummond said this to Mike Anthony, a CT insider. Uh, I think I'm already there. Drummond said, I'm on the way, I'm on my way. By the time I retire, I'll go down as the best rebounder ever, ever, if not already. Um, yeah, I'm gonna let y'all chime in on this. Uh, do you ever see Andre Drummond <laughs> being seen as? statistically or just seen by basketball purist people as the best rebound ever. Is he even close to that? We're going to start with you, right? Man, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, and then he said, by the time I retire, I mean, dude, like, you're nowhere close now and your best days are obviously behind you, so what do you think you're going to do between now and the time you hang it up to put you in that conversation? Like, I, I, I don't understand the rationale behind this comment or like what, what evidence he has to back this up. <laughs> um, but yeah, bro, uh, just should have kept that to yourself, man. Like n- nobody, <laughs> nobody is going to co-sign that. Like, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm confused, but uh, hey, do you, man? Like if if you, if you believe in yourself that much, then kudos, pass that confidence on to your kids or something. But uh, <laughs> yeah, 
that's that'll be the only time we hear those words uttered about Andre Drummond. So what's up with your UConn man? Be dancing. What's going on? I just can't. Like, <laughs> I just, I truly can't, man. Like, this is a dude athletically that is on like one of the like the upper percentiles of God passing at athleticism and in frames like that. And bro, like it, it's never been a question about can you be that. Like, it's good hearing you say that. They're like, go out and do it. And everywhere you've been, they've just wanted you to go out and do it. Like, it's hard for me to take any of this seriously coming off of last year's postseason. You were by far the largest human being on that court in the first round series between you and the Celtics. We never felt like you consistently were the largest man on the floor in that series that entire time. So to, to evoke names that you mentioned before, like, nah, man. And I'm happy with that confidence. That's cool, man. But, like, I'm happy that he's achieved a lot. But, like, it's he's one of the dudes, like, even when he left college, like, you're always left, you're always left, like, wanting more or wondering what everything could have been. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's a knock. It's just he's, one, he, he's like, one of, like, he's that freaking gifted athletically. Like, stuff was left on the table, man. And so, I hear you. Like, I, I would legit entertain it if I felt like you're one of the dudes where, like, I know that it was 150% every time you were out there. Like, I feel like you maxed out everything you had. I always felt just left wanting more all the time. So, like, I'm just going to, that's the politest way I could say. Decline to uh, agree with his, his comments. Yes. I'll tell you. Yeah, I'm going to try not to give this a lot of energy because it doesn't deserve it. Um, just, I always felt like the loudest person in the room is usually the weakest person in the room. If you have to say all of this stuff, I mean, most of the times if it was really something that was in the realm of a possibility, us as the media or everybody else in the world would be talking about it. Um, you to kind of declare it for yourself is kind of, Asinine, if you ask me. Um, but granted, like Ray said, have the best confidence in the world. But um, you should have that quiet confidence and keep it to yourself. Um, like you said, he's uh, he's already played eleven seasons. His good his his best days are behind him. Um, he's only I mean we know Father Time is undefeated. So um, if you're not there yet, I don't know how you think that you're going to be better than Dennis Rodman. Like, are we, are we, are we, we really, I, I don't even have any more words. I already gave it too much energy. I'm done. Yeah, just, look, man, ain't, ain't you leaving out guys like Charles Barkley and, uh, though, we saw Rodman do at a basically 6'6". Six, six. I'm not trying to hit nobody now talking about they had to the best <laughs> one all the time, though. Like, my man was, <laughs> like, it was like a nine-year stretch, though. He was averaging like 15 a game, though. Like, that, it, it, in that damn era, that damn physical ass era, dog. Like it was insane. Like he was getting like 30, 40 rebound games. You like, what the hell? Like it it dog, like no man. Like and, and Bill Russell and Will and all like they don't even they they don't even dog. That's 20 a game for their career. <laughs> like, what are we talking about here? Both of them, dog. Like it's nothing to talk about. And you're not even the best rebounder in this area. Yeah. <laughs> You may have won a couple of rebounding titles, but how many Robin went in a row? Like seven? Like, all right, then. You know, <laughs> going against the monsters, he had the Shaqs, the Ewings, the Lajuans, the Rick Smiths, the Zoes, the David Robinsons, all those monsters. It's uh, Tim Duncan, all those guys, Barkley, uh, uh, Kevin McHale, all, Robert Parrish, all, Brad, oh, all those monsters, he. And you playing against six, seven centers and can't even get seven. This this is this, this is a weird ass area. I'm just gonna say it. Man. Y'all don't want it. <laughs> I, I, I just find myself being more quiet for peace because they're gonna make me cuss people out, man. I don't want to do that, man. And you like your yeah, asshole. It's just like, come on, man. Like, how do y'all just go around just saying things like this? Like, who gassing y'all? And this is how you know these dudes have some serious ass kissing yes men in their corner. Because I know that some friends telling them that, feeding them that BS. 
I'm, and, and let's be all real. What metric is he using to justify a feeling this way? It, it has to be total rebounds a game, and even then, like, no. No. Just... It says he averages 13.3 rebounds, and he's currently ranked number 11 all-time in league history with 9,519. So, you're, so I, I guess he thinks he's going to pass 10 more people. <laughs> Averaging 13.3. And I'll be honest, I don't even know he uh, got, uh, got picked up out of bull. So I'm like, you're not even starting. Well, we're going to start. You know, we're going to get young. Right? Uh, uh, we out of time, so I'm going to just end it with this. Um, a little bit of trash, but you know, history. Charlene Curtis, uh, first black woman head coach in the ACC, died last Thursday at the Battle of Cancer. Uh, she was 67. Uh, she was the head coach at Wake Forest from 1997 to 2004 after head coaching stops at Radford and Temple, where she also was the first African American head women's basketball coach. Uh, Curtis played basketball at Radford shortly. After the passage of Title IX in 1972, and became the school's first 1,000 point scorer, male or female, and a member of the Hall of Fame. She majored in music and joined, rap, joined a Radford women's basketball team that didn't offer scholarships at the time. Uh, Curtis worked in the ACC League office as a supervisor of official for women's basketball for 11 years, retiring in 2019. Along with her ACC job, Curtis spent that time as the coordinator of women's basketball officials for the Southern Conference, the Big South, and the Colonial Athletic Association. Uh, Charlene was a pioneer in the sport of women's basketball, but more importantly, she was an amazing individual, said ACC Commissioner Jeff Phillips. Her kindness and class resonated throughout her life, and she would be missed by all who were fortunate to know her and her inspiring spirit. A native of Roanoke, Virginia, uh, her early coaching jobs including an assistant at Radford and graduate assistant coach at Virginia in 1981. She worked with Virginia head coach Debbie Ryan and uh, then assistant, you may know him, Gino Ariema. Uh, Curtis became Radford's head coach in 1984 at the age of 29, finishing with a 121-53 record in six seasons. Uh, she also worked two years as an assistant at UConn before being hired at Wake Forest. Uh, just one of your thoughts on the late Charlene Curtis, uh, obviously uh, a pioneer in the game of basketball. I'm not even going to just say women's basketball, I'm just basketball in general. Uh, we, right back to you. Uh, we're going to be a Wilson's on you. Oh man, just just have to thank her for what she did. Um, just honest, like you said, just for what it means to the sport as a whole. Um, we all know what it looked like. Um, like, look, we just we just uh, what was it called? A few months ago, finished a documentary about a person who was well deserving of of coaching, of getting a head coaching gig, and never got an opportunity. Um, going further back, so think about how many people that deserving that didn't get it. Now that was a black man. Let's you know, double it. This is a black woman. Uh, going through it in that time, bro, it, it's it's huge what she was able to accomplish. Um, and then now, like, those are the people that, that need to be celebrated. Um, because now we have the luxury of looking around the women's game nowadays and seeing people that look like her on the sidelines far more often than we've seen coming up before. You know, it, it wasn't as frequent. Um, we're seeing it more in, in the W little by little. Uh, but it all had to start somewhere. So, you know, it's just one of those things where uh, people like, like her, a uh, woman like her, just shouldn't be forgotten for, for what they've accomplished. And again, first black head coach in the ACC, it's not a small conference. All right, folks, like ACC been around for quite a while. It's several different iterations of the ACC. We all know where the ACC is located geographically. Think about what that meant, being the first oh. female head coach in the ACC. Again, geographically. So kudos to her. Um, just grateful for what she's done for the game. Yeah, just like Wilson said, um, especially, you know, me, myself, having, you know, black women as coaches was definitely something that was always inspiration to me. Um, granted, I will have to say my dad was mostly my coach, but he always made sure to bring in top tier black women coaches to help us as well. Um, so those type of relationships as a player and a coach are, are something that's, you know, kind of unmatched. So for her to be able to do that on a, on a larger scale and show other black women that they can also become ho uh, coaches and, 
in a higher field um, and not even just in basketball. You know, we see a lot of uh, black women getting coaches in, you know, the NFL and all types of, you know, places nowadays. So um, like you said, the ACC being the ACC is not a small conference and not a small feat. Um, so we always just have to make sure that we show our respect and pay our and pay our respects to, you know, those people that kind of break down the barriers for us, because like you said, we're seeing more and more of it now and it, and it never would have started without her. So, you know, definitely prayers to her family. Um, to see that she died as long as she did. I mean, 67 is pretty young. Um, and mm. hopefully that, uh, you know, everybody is able to, you know, like I said, still remember her contributions to the sport um, and just wish her family the best. Right. Yeah. Um, like whenever somebody, you know, in, in her position passes away, like, you know, a, a person that, cast a pretty big shadow over, you know, over the game. But I guarantee if you just ask, you know, a random person that, you know, that says they follow basketball, they wouldn't know who she is. Um, I, I think that's a, a failure of, um, you know, of media and, um, you know, and the people that are, you know, that kind of have the platform to tell these stories. Because if you, if you were dependent upon that information, you would think, that black female head coaches started with Don Staley, you know, and it's no knock to her at all. You know, she deserves every bit of praise and recognition she gets. But um, and and she's even good herself about acknowledging, you know, who came before her and who set her on her path. But um, I, I just think people need to need to give these people their their recognition, man. Like um, like Wilson brought up, y'all just did the Ed Myers documentary. Like everybody that <laughs> plays basketball, writes back about basketball, talks about basketball, should know who she, who he is. And the same for um for uh, Miss Curtis. Like it, people need to start, you know, really, really reporting on this game the right way, man. Because there's no way she should she should pass away without being um being recognized, like uh. I did, I meant to I meant to look earlier when I first saw she passed, but was was she inducted into the Hall of Fame? Like if yeah, not, she definitely know. should should be there. So yeah, you know it, it say what? No, I was just saying I didn't see any notes on that. I gotta look it up. Yeah, man, like it's, it's stuff like that, man. Like she for what she for what she did and you read off the resume, like she needs to be recognized in the highest way possible. Um so it you know, it, it always um, that type of stuff always crosses my mind when, when you know when we get into a situation like this. Like, how as long as people have been reporting on basketball, this story hasn't been brought to the masses. But um, but yeah, man, definitely condolences to her family and friends. And um, yeah, she she's a, a trailblazer ever since her work. Yeah, for me, this is just another reminder of why you gotta respect your history. Um, we just in a funny time where especially young people they well we young but you know what i mean younger people just getting in the field fresh out of college where it's just like the cool thing the shit on the past and i'm just like bro and the lady anybody i'm like to know where you're going you gotta know where you've been they they've been there and done that you know what i mean and they can make your road a lot easier if you humble yourself and just listen just get some game you know what i mean that's what it's about i felt like in our generation we had that Hell, we got it. Rather, we even if we didn't want to, we got it. They would still tell us, you know what I'm saying? Because they knew like you're 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 headed down a bad road, and um, we care about you, so we gonna give you the information whether you want it or not, so you can make better decisions. You know what I mean? Before you do something mess up, and there's no coming back from it. Uh, it's sad, like, and I'm, I'm deep in basketball, and I never heard of it. That's sad. Never heard of it. You know what I mean? Uh, probably, I guess, the coach of her at her time, as far as black women, Vivian Stringer. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? But, you know, you know Vivian because of the Nike connection, or the, the tours and stuff like that, and the success she had at Rutgers. I'm not even sure how long, uh, you know, Carolyn was at, at Wake Forest or whatnot, mm -hmm. but she should be mentioned. They mentioned, they briefly mentioned, like, Peck. Who's on ESPN? The first black woman to win the NCAA championship. You know what I'm saying? They barely mention her. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 it's so many 
it's just an injustice. Let's just call it what it is, man. It's it's an injustice. It's all about clicks and views and getting advertising dollars. And if it's not a big story, I guess if the masses don't care about it, they don't push for it. But some things just need to be spoken about, and so some things need to be written about so people will know. You shouldn't. The, I should not be hearing about this lady for the first time after she passed. That's crazy. And maybe she was quiet. Maybe she didn't want the spotlight. Who knows? You know what I mean? Then just say that. Just make a note like, yo, she was the first, but but she not. She don't like the spotlight like that. She liked to be with her family, and we would respect that. Cool. But at least we know. No clue. You know what I mean? And see, that's the stuff where. You know, when we talk about the WNBA, that and, and, and I've talked to a lot of women, we, we talk about the complaining off wax that they do about just complaining, complaining all the time, and just turning people off, even women. Like, yo, I'm coming to support y'all. I don't want to hear a bunch of crying and whining all the time. Mm-hmm. Why don't they report that? Why don't they speak on that? You know, y'all know Carolyn, y'all know Carolyn, you know, just say that. Just put that tweet out. Y'all know she was the first black woman in ACC history at Workforce. We like, what? And that's going to make so many young people, people, because one athlete in the WBA said it, just go and look her up. And now she's getting her shine. And then you probably going to have clout chasing people and read it. Hey, the ESPN, hey, you know, we want to do a story on you. Now she's in the spotlight. And now in the world will know. You understand what I'm saying? We need to celebrate them more because it's become cool not to celebrate them. But we need the information to know about them. Why, why hasn't Wake Forest put, put her out there? Maybe she's on a wall down there at the university. But if you're not at the university, how will, you know what I'm saying? How will anybody know? Mm-hmm. So it, it's just it's just sad, man, that we just learning about this. So now I got to do some research, see what she did, see if she produced um, the people that came from her tree. You know, it's players that may have went on to coach and do great things and develop great players and stuff. It, it's just great. Like you saw the Geno connection. She worked with Geno. And, and then went to work at UConn probably under Geno. So that tells you she could coach. She had a winning record at Radford and everything. So she did damage. And we still don't know to the extent. So it, it's just sad, man. But this is why we got to celebrate our pioneers, man. Because once they're gone, they're gone. And um, and if we don't have the information, the work they put in is gone in vain. That's why I was so, you know, um, the thing that motivated me about Ed, I forgot what coach passed away. Um, I was like, I gotta get this job done. Like now. Cause I cause Ed has health problems and stuff, and I don't want him to go and don't even see that. So now he knows people can learn what he did. And you know what I'm saying? So it, like I, I I hate to I hate to see this, man, because we should be learning as hell. She should be in history books when we come up through school. You know what I'm saying? Learning about that. Just a, just a quick note, but it is what it is, man. Um, we in media, so we, we just want to dig and, and do it on our own. So obviously, certain outlets ain't gonna do it. We can say it. Yeah, it's nuts. And answer your question from she coached at Wake Forest from '97 to 2004. That's modern. That's crazy. yeah. So that's a seven-year stint in modern-day basketball. That's crazy. In the ACC. And, and I had two. Started. Yes. Started and I had two friends that played at Wake Forest two years after that. Yeah. Yeah. So again, you talk about digging and going to find out. I'm sure her imprint is over so much. It, you know, has impacted the game in so many different ways. So many different players, what have you. Again, uh, happy to bring Thank to bring you. it to light and share with you all. Go ahead, Cardo. Let's be real. During that period. Women's college basketball, it was Tennessee. Yep. And UConn. Yep. Oh, like, oh, yeah. like, we just got to keep it real. That's no, no, no. We cared it, about that time. So, yeah, yeah, I can see how they were overlooked. Unless they were like on that level going 30 and 0, smack. Yep. All anybody, all ESP put on was Tennessee and UConn. Mm-hmm. And it's maybe some random job. And then, it, but it still was bad because this was literally ACC country, the Maryland Duke mm-hmm. one. Like we knew the women's side as, as well as the men's, like, but we never knew her. Like, that's sad. Like, even and when then, the WBA started, it's, that, that's and then crazy. and even then, I, I'm a whole Connecticut, not not the school, but just as a whole, up to that standard too, because we hear about other people that have spent. We've heard about people that spent briefer stints at Connecticut on Geno staff for two seconds. Um, when someone's done this, how come? Like I, I hear about other people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to hold that media to that standard, too. You want to call it, 
you know, they they call it what uh what's what, what is it? What is what do they call it? Uh college basketball capital of the world or whatever that they call it for all the championships, all the crap that's up there, that's cool, whatever. So I'm gonna hold them to that standard, like this is directly connected to you. Why don't we know? You know what I'm saying? It's directly connected to you. And you unlike some schools where and I, I get what you're saying, I'm not talking about during that time. Cause obviously, like look, it was it was Tim, it was Pat, it was Gino. Everybody else, you get in where you fit in. Not talking about that. There's no issue with that. But I'm talking about post that. I've heard about people who have accomplished less that have spent 10 seconds on that staff before. Um, that 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 school is in the same place as the headquarters of a full letter network. Like what that? Why are we just hearing about this? It's so many. It's, it's like, like, like this. we gotta dig deep, dog. Like now, and it's and it's like that with, and I don't even want to make it a rivalry with, with black um on the high school level here. All right, uh, the lady, the coach, uh, Tamika, um, at Sidwell, got a powerhouse. She's doing an excellent job, right? They call her the greatest um, high school coach in the area, like ever. And I'm like, hold on, I grew up with Riverdale was doing what she's doing <laughs> like every year for like twenty Diane mm-hmm. Richards. That's how John Crown ended up at uh, GW and turned that program around. Mm-hmm. And she had to be assistant for a long time because they wouldn't really give her a head coach a job, but they were recruiting her damn players. They were like the female okay. All throughout my house here, before me, after me, like they they were so dumb, it wasn't even fair, though. Like, I mean, 12 D1 recruits, they year in, year out, just smacking people, smacking people. Diane Rich, she don't even get the love she deserves. Unless you really grew up during that time, you 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 know. But if you don't know the history, it's just that's why I mean like it's important to know history so you can understand impacts and stuff like that, and legacies. So you know it's a high standard you're trying to reach. If you don't think you're the greatest off top, you feel what I'm saying? So, it, I mean, bro, it, it's bad, man. But we hey, we we got a platform, so we can shine a light on it. So I'm definitely gonna do some research on it, and see what she was all about. Though. We shouldn't, this shouldn't be the first time we're hearing about it. And I see on Twitter all the schools showing her love now that she passed away. Go figure. It, oh my goodness. Like you said, in, you said in injustice, and I think that was a perfect way to describe it. Because, again, it, it's it's amazing that you can compile all this stuff after you find out someone passed. But all the times we're at games, we're at stadiums, when they're putting the dumbest trivia questions up in the world. How about you put stuff about your game up? You know, like, there's all these opportunities. Like, capitalize on them. What Dave Chappelle say? He said, I'll ever be the first black person to do anything. <laughs> oh, man. It's, 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 it's crazy. Hey, but... Dave, he's the first in so many things, right? You ain't know. To, like, it's, you, don't get, you, don't get the, you don't get the flowers, dog. I'm sitting point. here prior to that documentary, like I've known what Peach Jam was my entire life. I look at the whole thing through a whole different lens and a whole different feeling every time I hear the words together. Um, again, just folks have to do better with sharing information, and I look forward to seeing what you come back with um, after the, after the research for sure. Well, thank you guys for tuning in this week. Don't forget, uh, follow the Focus TV on all your social media mediums. Uh, Wednesday mornings. Roku channel, if you got a Roku television device, all you have to do is uh, type in the Focus TV in the search box, double click OK on your remote to add the channel. For obviously these shows that come out every week and then anything else that we have going on as well, you know, Mystics Outlook, uh, Wizards Outlook going to be back very, very, very soon. College basketball is like a hop, skipping a jump away from media day. Uh, you know, uh, and if a wrap up will be back pretty soon, like we have stuff going on soon. Uh, you know, we encourage you guys to definitely check it out, the morning show, what have you. Uh, Friday nights, 10 p.m. DC TV is where you can watch this every week in case you don't have a Roku television or device. But you guys, thank you for spending time with us this week. We'll see you next week uh, with even more. And I'll look back to check, look forward to checking back in with you guys on ever-changing things in sports, especially the things that we cover each and every week. Y'all have a great one.